Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. A sunny day compared to yesterday. So. This is the first time I've ever read a book written by three people. And it was such an engaging and charming book. And I want to thank you both for it and RJ, who couldn't be here today. Because in this book are so many things that siblings and parents will recognize in one another, but with a difference, that one of the two twins has autism. Now, twins are the agencies that science does its work by. You study twins to see whether they differ in different environments or circumstances or stresses. But the twin relationship is a singular one, and you're going to hear about it in a singular circumstance today from the authors, Holly Robinson Peet, her daughter, Ryan Elizabeth Peet, and her son, RJ Peet, who isn't here. The book is Same But Different, Teen Life on the Autism Express. Thank you for being here. It's our pleasure to Thank be you. here. So first to Ryan, obviously when you're a twin, you have a special connection. But in the case of your brother, it's especially special and with the usual stresses and love, but then some. Talk about that relationship a little bit. Well, uh, RJ and I have always had a very special connection, like you said. Um, twins in general always have the special bond. But with me and RJ, it's, it's definitely stronger because of his differences. I feel a lot more protective over him because of the fact that he's different and um, and yeah, it's just, it makes our relationship so much more complex because um, we're constantly learning, like I'm constantly learning through him about, um, about different things about autism and stuff, and so. And Holly, you encouraged them to write this book. What did you hope it would do? I first wa really wanted RJ's voice to be heard. We often hear or about projects, uh, especially books, written about children with autism, but we rarely hear their, their narrative. We rarely hear what's going on in their head um, in relationship to, uh, in relation to something really specific. So it was important that RJ be involved in this project because autism is a, such a unique disorder in that each kid is different. And RJ is such a unique individual and, um, you know, Ryan's perspective as a sibling was really important to be heard. But this project, having RJ speak and, and be heard was essential. And you chose to use different names in this, yeah. Callie and Charlie. Why is that? Well, the story is based off of our own experiences. Um, and uh, because it's like not exactly like the same, like things that we went through. So you could take liberties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we wanted to fold in stories of families that we've met along the way. So even though all the things that happened in Same But Different didn't happen to our family, they've happened to other families. And uh, we've learned in our journey with autism, being on the Autism Express, if you will, that families have so many situations that they can relate to. And we didn't see a book like this available at all. Um, your brother's voice comes through very strongly in this. At one point, he's, when he's going to school, he says, I'm sick of being special. I don't want to be special anymore. I want to be in the main room in school. All I ever hear my parents talking about is getting me into the mainstream. Well, there's nothing main about having kids look at you like I just farted. Is that why I'm special? <laughs> he sounds like a funny kid. Yeah, he's hilarious. He he's has so a, funny. He has a very unique uh, sense of humor, which is something that kids with autism don't always get to express. You know, we tend to think of them if they're nonverbal, have verbally challenged, or if they're highly verbal and on the far side of the spectrum with Asperger's, um, you rarely hear their sense of humor and it's very unique. And for you, you go back and forth and, and some of this book sums it up, how much you love him, but sometimes you're resentful. I mean, we all resent our brothers yeah. at some point, but it's a different order because you're expected to be a kind of a little mom and he's perceived you as that kind of controlling figure. No offense, Holly. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, yeah, definitely. Um, just anybody who has a s uh, sibling with special needs in general, um, it's very difficult because um, your achievements don't seem as um, as great as their victories. You know, like it's um, it's very difficult because you're um, you're always in second place. You always have to do things for your brother. You always have to do things. Um, for your brother, you don't necessarily get to take time for yourself. Yeah. And 
um, it's extremely rewarding, and I, of course, will always care for my brother and be protective of my brother, but at the same time, it's hard for me to take time for myself and the girl And Holly, the, they write about going on vacation, and everything about the vacation has to be gauged to RJ, how you get on the plane, when you actually go in the water on your vacation. Yeah, so anyone who has a, a child with special needs knows knows that when you go on vacation <laughs> with your child, um, you can often struggle to make that the absolute best situation for every one of your kids. So the siblings do tend to suffer. You know, we've been on airplanes with our kid with autism. We've been, uh, you know, on different vacations or at parties where we've had to cut things short. And the other kids suffer. You know, they don't get to have all the full experience that they um, should. And so it tends to be a little difficult. Uh, I can remember going on airplanes with RJ uh, when he would just push the button to get the flight attendant to come. I mean, all the like three hours just pushing that button. And it was, <laughs> you know, it was so hard. Um, and it's hard to find people who are compassionate and who understand these children and how compassionate, uh, how, how amazing they are. Same but different is special because we, we wanted to talk about when they become teenagers and what happens when they become teenagers and how do they, how does the, the autism impact th that part of their lives? Um, there's an additional layer of concern you write about. It's a mom of a black son, the anxieties are compounded. People with autism generally can't read the emotions of, of other people. So you find yourself in a dicey situation and you're concerned that your son can't figure out what's going on around him. Yes, uh, young people with autism don't always read social cues. So we do address in the book that I have a young son who's 6'3", he's African American. Um, I panic often, as many moms do, but especially these days uh, with police issues and um, you know, I panic that he's going to be somewhere and not be able to respond in the proper way if he gets rolled up on by a cop and says, put your hands up. So we have actually role played with him to try to get him to understand that he can't call his mommy because that's what he said is the first thing he wants to do. He said, you can't reach in your pocket and call your mommy. So, uh, you know, part of w one of the things that I would love to see in the community is more awareness of how to deal with people with special needs um, and so that we don't have any headlines and hashtags, if you know what I mean. Was it different when you were both kids? And so like most twins, you may have had a special language, a kind of way of communicating that the adults couldn't understand? Um, like our relationship? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, it was very different. Um, when we were kids, um, in some ways we just, we connected um, so much, I don't wanna say better than we do now, but um, but you know, it was a very, it was more emotional, I think, our relationship. And um, we just smiled and laughed and played. And I don't think that, I think that um, what caused our relationship to necessarily change is the impact that society has on, um, on those with autism as we were growing up and stuff. And, um, and yeah, I just, I think that, um, yeah. Um, as you got older, um, you went a year ahead in school, and you were always kind of looking over your shoulder. There's a scene where he's in a new class, and these guys are making friends with him mm -hmm. and telling him, please bring $50 for pizza. Yeah. <laughs> and you all know that pizza doesn't cost $50, yeah. that they're just taking sheer advantage of him. But you want to protect him, but at the same time, you know he's going to resent being protected. Exactly. That's a classic example of how both of you try to figure out how to let him be his own person but not hurt himself. How do you negotiate those? Oh, it's so difficult because RJ just wants to have friends. Kids with autism really need friends and it's hard for them to make those relationships. So when kids roll up and say, hey RJ, uh, can you, can you, uh, you know, give me uh, $50 for pizza, you clearly get a kid that is dying to have a relationship. So he will bring that money to school in order to make these connections. Um, as his twin sister, Ryan, being at school with him, wants to protect him, but she also wants to give him the ability and the freedom to learn in these situations. But and she doesn't want him to be taken advantage of. Yeah. It's a very difficult line to cross. And then he also kind of got resentful um, towards me when I tried to go in and be like, hey, you can't 
do that. Like, these people aren't your friends. And he's just it's like, go away, Ryan. You don't know anything. Like, these are the people for me. Like, it was, it's very hard to, like, I don't know. It's just very hard to police him and to steer him in the right direction. Ryan has always been her brother's keeper. I mean, you had to go through Ryan to get to RJ. And when he tried to express his independence as a young man with autism in a uh, hi junior high school or middle school, as we call it these days, um, it, it, she really had to keep her distance. And it, it built a little bit of resentment, and it made him push back on her. One of the things that we're waiting for the Air Force to go over. There, I feel safer now. Um, one of the things that struck me about this book that I hadn't read elsewhere is how well it got inside the head of the experience of being autistic. And let me read you just a little bit here. This is when um, RJ, Charlie in the book, has a new class. The bell rings, that loud bell kills my head. It's time to move to the next class. I somehow have to get to math. I hate changing rooms. I call it the torture race. Go to my locker, struggle with the code, put back one set of books, pull out another. Kids all talking loudly, strong smells, bad smells, bright lights that slice at me, colors that punch in my eyes. I wish I could wear my headphones at school, but it's against the rules. I'm a sweaty mess by the time I switch rooms. I didn't make it to the bathroom in between classes, so when I get to my next class, I need to pee badly. And it just, it took me inside his head in a way I hadn't, as I said, I hadn't seen anywhere else. Autism is such a difficult thing to try to explain to someone. Even I've, we've been on this autism journey for, you know, 15, 16 years, and th it's still hard to explain. I'm always asking RJ for his perspective. We, we started a, a reality project on the OWN Network called For Pete's Sake, and one of the reasons why I wanted to do it was because I wanted him to s use his own voice to say what he was experiencing. And one of the things he said recently was that I asked him what it was like to be nonverbal because he got language, thank God, when he was 10, 11, 12. And he said, Mom, it was like having a ball stuck in your throat. And I thought that was such a profound way to put it. Um, and so I think the more we allow the narrative to come from people who actually have autism, the better the understanding in the community might be. It's my hope, anyway. What were the mechanics of getting his chapters out of him for this book? <laughs> it was I mean, it was it definitely was rough because he didn't necessarily want to talk about these things. And especially because the book is based off of experiences that we had in middle school. And that was a really rough time. And it's rough for everybody, but especially rough no, especially, for him. especially, yeah, because we were in the same school. Um, I was in eighth grade. He was in seventh grade. And he was dealing with the same issue. Like, a lot of the friend issues that he had in here are very similar to the same issues that he had actually in middle school. And, um, and he didn't necessarily want to talk about it. And um, meanwhile, I'm like, okay, let's, like, talk all about it, we need to spread the word, we need to tell people about our experiences, and he was very reluctant to do so. Um, and so, so we, we had to, yeah, we had we to, had to bribe him, Yeah, we basically. had to like, bribe him. We what did you bribe him with? We had to offer him tickets to the Rihanna concert. <laughs> um, wow. Um, oh yeah, he loves Rihanna, so you know, anything, anytime I can dangle that Rihanna <laughs> banana, you know, in front of him, he, he loves that. Um, uh, we, we, you know, travel. He likes to travel. He likes sporting games. We'd say, okay, if you give us four hours of an interview where you can talk to us about, you know, what your experiences are. And then we really had to convince him uh, about his advocacy, how amazingly impactful and powerful it is for him to speak. And he gets that, especially when we come to things like this or when we travel the country or when we open centers and au autism um, centers around the country because he w sees firsthand how his advocacy impacts people and he loves that. So it's just hard for him to make that jump because what kid wants to sit down and just you know talk to you? What teenager wants to sit down and just talk to you forever? <laughs> but what we got out of him, what we were able to mine from him was really autism gold, if you will. It was just so, such good stuff. So it was, it was very worth revealing. it. Yeah. yeah. Now, for you, you, of course, this is the sibling you know. Yeah. But there's a chapter in the book, Callie says, hey, you, Charlie, I would never in a million years ask this to your face, but I ask it to my own face a lot when I look in the mirror. Why me? Why did I have to be born the twin with a brother like you? Why do I have to be the strong one? Why am I the one who flies in on a rescue helicopter again and again and again to save you from whatever bug or hairbrushes or insult 
is flying in your direction. That's a really honest thing to say. Yeah. Um, you know, especially like at this time, um, being a sibling with autism, like or having a sibling with autism is really difficult. And like I said earlier, um, you often put your obligations aside to help your sibling. And so um, I'd often have to take care of him. And I think and now at this point, I was getting really frustrated with the fact that he was so reluctant to take my help. And I just got tired, you know? I was very tired of trying to um, tell him what's right and for him not to listen to me. And I was, I felt myself getting stressed out about this whole situation. And it, you know, it just got really frustrating. And it still is in today frustrating to have a sibling with autism because you know you want, like you, I want the best for him. And it's just hard sometimes. But to he doesn't always know what's best for him. Yeah, he always, yeah, sometimes he doesn't always know what's and best. And for Ryan, I mean, what you've had to experience, and from a mother's point of view, I wanted to make sure she felt she could soar, she could fly. And I think she felt burdened. No, she never complained about any of these failed parties or vacations cut short or leaving restaurants early because she felt so connected to her brother and she, she took on the autism herself. One of the things that was interesting, and I think I said in the um, in the in the opening um, letter, uh, was that when Ryan went into uh, when when the when the RJ was diagnosed in 2000, she went in with him to for the evaluation, and she mimicked everything he did. Yeah, and they thought I had and autism she got as that well. autism diagnosis <laughs> as well. I was like, wow, she's still she's still standing in front of a train for him. You know, she's like, if you're going down, I'm going down, and that's how she's always been. Now she's you know about to go off to college. And it's a new phase for us, um, and you know I want it's time her time for her to soar, and time for her to you know sort of put back her babysitting of of this amazing kid that she's been there yeah. for her whole life. What did you learn about one another as you were reading this book and working on it that you hadn't known before? Um, one thing I learned about you is I mean I always knew you were pretty honest, but I didn't know you were that honest you know like you got really real in that book especially in your opening and closing like letters in the book um yeah i was really surprised at how honest you got and how real um you got with this book well you surprised me in the fact that you you know you really dug deep and brought back some ugly times and that's not an easy thing to do um and so your maturity level and recounting your story the whole time, knowing that you're advocating for other siblings, has been was been really phenomenal to see. So you know, we discovered we, we also got on each other's nerves often writing this book, as you I'm yeah, because sure like there were some things I wanted to include that she was like no 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 no, and then like vice versa, and, and then yeah, so we definitely we yeah struggled. We, we we definitely fought a little bit, but that's you know that's part of it. If it's an easy process, then it's not worth it. So your brother got Rihanna tickets for doing this. What'd you get? <laughs> I, you know, I'm just. The you book. didn't get anything. I didn't get any. Well, oh I mean, really? No, okay. I. Um, hmm. Huh? I, <laughs> I got. <laughs> this is called being on the spot. I know. <laughs> I think about that How for a second. How do you handle that? Um, I got. You know, I. You I'm got just rewarded with the amount of um, people that have been helped by this book. Very you know? good. Very so good answer. That that's my present, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> the give back is yeah. your reward. Um, Ryan is about to um, go to college in. Um, I I can say oh, it. Can say I it? can say it. It's okay. Oh, okay, okay. She's about to go to college back east, um, and she's you know really going to branch out, and and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what what else she does. In yeah. Her life as an advocate for yeah. autism and everything else. It's yeah with me and. Like on the topic of moving away for college, um, RJ is super like tense about it. He's super like, wait, like no, you can't leave. Like, like he's still wanting me to come and stay. He wants you to go home. here. He wants, yeah, him where and my dad, dad wants her, her to go went. here. He wants um, her to go yeah, here. Yeah, they all want me to go <laughs> here. Um, and unfortunately, I'm like committed somewhere else, but uh, <laughs> far away. <laughs> but <laughs> she wants to go. <laughs> but. Um, but you know, yeah, he's being really, he's super tense about it. He comes into my room and we talk about this a lot. And he's like, are we, like, am I gonna, like, call, I'm gonna call you every day. Like, we're gonna talk all the time. We need to, yeah, we need to FaceTime and all this stuff. But yeah, it's, it's real. And like, you know, for me, like, I'm excited, like my mom said, to also 
um, branch off and go explore and do my own thing. But at the same time, I'm scared to leave my brother because I've always been so protective of him. And so now that I'm leaving, I'm just kind of like, okay, like, who's, like, I'm... It's your gonna, time. Who's going to... It's your time. Yeah. yeah. We got him. It's okay. Your time. okay. <laughs> what, what does he think of the book? He, he loves it. He wants to know if Rihanna has read it. <laughs> <laughs> and has she? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if she's read it, but she's aware of it. Put it that way. Um, and he, 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 lo he loves the advocacy. He really gets that he has an impact on the community. Um, you know, the work and, and, and doing the work to lead up to it, that the, it being in the weeds of a book like this was hard for him. But he really gets it, so he's proud of it. Uh, before we go to some questions from the audience, there are people who have kids who have autism, and as RJ says, I have autism, it doesn't have me, which mm -hmm. is a great line, but who worry about them when they're old enough to live on their own, when their parents aren't there, when you aren't there for them anymore. What, what message is there for those people? The message is that more and more conversation, and one of the reasons why we wrote this book about what happens to these young people when they need to get out in the world, they need jobs, community, compassion, they need you know group homes, place to live, self-advocacy, there's so many things that they need. And the idea is that it's here, but, but it's, a, it's about a compassionate community so the community has become much more compassionate towards our children as they grow older now. So that's the good news. I mean, the hard, the hard news is the fact that, you know, we don't want to let them go. Uh, and we, and we, we worry about them. We worry about their, the way they process. You spoke to it earlier. They process social cues and them getting in situations that could be really, I mean, deadly in some cases. And so we worry. We stress as moms. But the good news is there are so many more resources. And I feel like the hot button issue in the autism community right now is really these kids that are becoming adults and coming into society, what do we do with them? They're actually quite brilliant in out-of-the-box ways. I was so impressed by his mastery of sports statistics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's I mean, so he's, good he's at got that. this masterful brain where he Maybe can Maybe he can you replace Vin Scully. Yeah, it, hey, you never know. Yeah. You know, I mean, vo verbally it might be kind of hard because Vin is a master, but he, he, you know, it's funny, the Dodgers reached out after seeing an episode of our show to say, hey, is there something he'd like to do here? So wow. that was the goal. We, I want every kid with autism to be able to have an opportunity to get a job in the mainstream. And many companies, the Microsofts, the, the Intels, the Walgreens of the world are reaching out, FedEx, to, you know, corporate America has more compassion now for these kids. So that's the good news, that you're getting corporate America to have conversations about young people with autism and what they can contribute. And the skills, the particular yes. skills that they can yeah, bring. Yeah, they're finding the skill set. Good. You know, and that's that's really important. Did you have something else? Um, just basically, yeah, I'm really, um, it's awesome of, with, this, uh, with all the uh, different opportunities that are, there are for those with special needs in the workforce and everything. Um, I'm very confident that my brother and those who are also affected um, with autism will end up having successful careers and um, be living successful lives. And, you know, with this book, there was um, one of the main reasons why we both decided that this book would be a good idea, and RJ, um, is because there was nothing out there that was based on um, going through the autism year, like going through autism through the teen years. And, um, yeah, I'm just really happy and um, excited um, to see where this book's going to go. Good. And Let's get yeah. some questions from the audience. You want to raise your hand? We are going to hold on to the microphones, not you, so don't reach for the mic. We need to hold on for audio recording reasons. So come on up and we will get your question. Tell us your name and your question. My name is Diane Galvez Parker, and I'm going to try to fit this all in. First of all, I started reading the book last night, <laughs> and I am so impressed with it. As, first of all, a mother, um, as an educator, I teach fifth grade. I can't wait to go back and re recommend this book to my students. Um, what I really liked about it, uh, you kind of touched on it, was the fact of the two different perspectives. What it's like as the sibling, but also what you were saying that a lot of times with autistic students or special needs, but I think about students in general is where as a teacher, I see the quiet ones. You, when you ask them to write something down, they have the most to say. So I really like that, and I look forward to recommending the book. The second, but can you my make? Uh, can we get is, a question? Yes. yes. My question is: You've talked about the role of Ryan. She's going to be leaving. What do you find is the role of the younger siblings? Are, do you find that they're also their brother's keeper? <laughs> yes, the younger siblings are like two annoying therapists. You know, there's nothing like a younger brother to really just 
me just mess you up and just make you go, oh. One day, RJ said to his younger brother, oh, well, you make me sick. I hate you. And me and my, his dad were like, yes. Like, he is really acting like a typical, <laughs> that's a typical older brother reaction. Um, you know, they are extremely, um, they understand that the torch is being passed down to them to look out for him. Um, and so that's, that's very important. Uh, and just Same But Different is a book that we really knew was needed. Uh, and I really appreciate you mentioning that you teach fifth grade because I feel like that's the target audience for a book like this. Um, I think we're just going to do a really good job at uh, getting the community to be aware of what these children are experiencing. Thank you. Thank we have you so much for your comments. Question? Your name and your question. My name is Elpidio Stolas. And as a person who has a personal friend who's autistic, where do you see yourself in terms of the educational process of maybe training teachers as well as organizations within the school district that continue to struggle with this very process? Because oftentimes what we've seen is that the person or the parent who doesn't necessarily have the means to reach out to the school district where they're from often are left blindsided. Yes, it's, a, it's very difficult to navigate the world of autism. Um, and there are, very, there, there are resources, there are regional centers, there are all kinds of places that can help navigate you, take you on this journey. But it is a struggle, and I have seen it firsthand. Uh, from IEPs to now he's 18 and the Department of Rehabilitation going back there, figuring out, I mean, there's so many things. And we have, you know, the blessing of resources and celebrity and all that comes with that. But for a single parent, for instance, dealing with it, it can be very difficult. My suggestion is that there are so many more resources. You just really have to roll up your sleeves, get on the internet, and just exhaust every resource you can find. Uh, and that's the good news about getting a diagnosis today or having a young person on the, on the spectrum today. What about having a state or county office of autism that can be a central clearinghouse for all these resources? Is oh, that worth that lobbying be, for? That would be amazing. And there has been quite a bit of legislation proposed and trying to get that. We really need an, an autism um, cent central, you know, that we need like an autism czar. With the prevalence that autism has now, that is off the charts, we are not responding in a way that matches the level of prevalence. So we got to get on that. Another question. Tell us your name and your question. My name is Dino. Um, the question I had to ask is uh, my nephew, he's 12 years old. He's uh, got autism. His name is Ryan Michael. We live in Michigan. The question I need to know is uh, when they get to like 18 years old, how is it m they can, um, how do you say, uh, how are they going to? Is it just living on their own, be on their being own, self, having self-advocacy? Work on themselves and everything. Well, That's it's what interesting. I was trying to know. It's because with me, he opened up to me. He never opened up to his parents. He never opened up to his family. It only came up to me. Well, you're that uncle then. So you got to, I mean, if, he, if you're that person that he responds to, You've been chosen. <laughs> that's a good thing. It can put a little pressure on you, but that's a good thing. That shows that he has the ability to open up. He has the desire to, he can be reached because you reach him. It's interesting. We just recently opened a, a, what we call an RJ's place in the Detroit Children's Center in that area. Take a look at that or tell your, your, is your brother, it's your brother's kid? They're from Michigan. Oh, they're from Michigan, they're but they live Michigan. here. Yeah. They live here. They live in Michigan. They live in uh, Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, so let them know about um, the children's, the Detroit Children's Center. They, they have really great programs for adolescents and pre-vocational programs to give them more um, resources about how to move through the, the, the adolescent life. Not enough information about that. Um, but you're that uncle, so you got to be there for him. And it's awesome that you were able to connect with him. Thank you. Thank you're you. Welcome. Another question. Just, just a comment I wanted to say to everyone here and say thank you for coming. And, and, and I don't know how many of you are impacted by autism. How many of you are affected by autism? Wow. I just want to thank you all for being so supportive of, you know, whether it's your children or whether it's your, like this gentleman, it's his nephew. It's the community that we need and the in-laws. And you need to build teams around these kids as they go through life. So we have a question. Uh, our questioner is hearing impaired, so I'll hear from her translator. Okay. Hello, my name is Lady, and I wanted to ask um, 
I'm Jess, and I have a cousin who is who has autism, and I was wondering if um, how many different levels are there to autism? Because I've seen some that are not able to communicate verbally, and um, I was wondering what the different kinds of levels for communication. The spectrum. Please tell Lindy, thank you for her question, and uh, the autism experience is a spectrum. It's a spectrum disorder, so it goes from uh, children who are nonverbal, who even though they don't talk, they have a whole lot to say, and they're in there, and they have a lot to contribute, to all the way to kids who are highly verbal. And I mean, brilliant, on another level, verbal can tell you everything about anything, yet can't look you in the eye and make a friend. So it's such a big, wide spectrum, and there's so many kids um, that are all over it, which is why autism is hard to classify. All the way through Asperger's. Yeah. Also, I was wondering um, if you still live with your brother. Or, I'm um, sorry, if you still, yeah, you still live with your brother. Yes, but our, our son still lives with us. He's 18, but our goal is to have him live on his own one day. Do we have an... Do we have another question? That's all the questions for now. Thank oh. you, audience, for your questions. All right. Now, can it. we um, let people know about the signing area? Absolutely. Or, okay. And please thank Thank you Ryan for coming. And we Holly. really appreciate having you. Yeah, thank you so much. And we'll let you know in one second about where they will be signing. Yeah, so we're going to Same but different. Yes, we'll be signing, and we're excited to meet you and, and speak with you. So thanks again for coming.